Okay, welcome to chapter seven, single dimensional arrays. So you should have used these already in the first semester class. I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly, just highlighting a, a couple things. You should go back and read it in more detail. Definitely read the chapter in, in the book. It's really important. Um, arrays are used all the time for like everything. I mean, it, every program I write probably has an array in it. So anyway, um, here's how you define an array. Here's a double array. You know, it could be int, could be string, could be boolean, whatever, but double open bracket, close bracket. My list is the variable name, new, double, and 10. And so there's, there's 10 of them. So that goes from zero to nine, right? There is no 10. So that's basic, basic stuff you gotta, gotta understand and know. Um, not just for programming, but also for interviews. You'll never get a job if you don't, don't understand that. Okay, let's see here. I'm declaring array variables. So here's how, how you declare it. Um, the old way is to put it afterwards. The new, newer way is to do this way. That's basically to be more consistent consistent among other languages also. Um, when you create a new array, basically, uh, let's see here, the zero element is the is the first one, and the 10, the nine is the last. So you need to know that you don't go off the end. You never, you can't have my list 10. It doesn't exist. Okay, um, so you declare that down. So this is declaring and creating in one step. So you declared it, my list. Like this, this part here creates the place of memory, and this says, oh, it's supposed to be ten, and makes it that down long. Length of array, um, my list length, my list dot length returns ten. Because remember, it was zero through nine. So that's so you can use that length a lot, especially in for loops when you're trying to loop through the arrays, which we do all all the time. Uh, default values when you define an array. Um, if it's a primitive data type like an int or a double small d, then it's, it's zero. Um, for character types, the Unicode zero, false for booleans. I always initialize anyway because when I'm creating an array, um, I'll, I'll define it and I'll write an a initialization routine to say initialize all to zero. Because a lot of times, many times, I have to I have to initialize it anyway later, you know, because I'm going to redo something. So I'm going to going to um, Create the array, initialize the array, process the array, then let's do it again and start over again. I'm going to initialize the array again, so I need to do it anyway. So I, I, I really don't you I don't rely upon this, um, especially I, I want to be able to uh, know directly what what's going to what it's initialized as. Okay, um, index variables. So you guys should know how to do this. My list two, this is my list zero. So basically, it's just a variable. It's just a, another way to to uh, list a variable name. Um, you can you can define your arrays um, right in when you define them. So you have a double here called my list. It has one, two, three, four, four. So it has a length of four, zero through three, right? So this is how you do it. You got a bracket and bracket ending in semicolon and just a comma between each item. So you can do, do that with strings, you can do it with integers, you can do it with boolean, with true falses. So it's all, all in one statement. Doesn't mean it's on one line, right? You could break it up in mul multiple lines, um, especially if you have like a, a two-dimensional array. But for a one-dimensional array, it probably fits on one line. Okay, um, here, initializing array with random values, so you're gonna loop through a for loop. For loops and arrays go, go together like hand in hand. Um, arrays are a certain length, right? And you use for loops when there's a certain length, you know the length. Here you're going from zero to while i is less than my list dot length. So if the list length changes at any time other places in the program, this code will still work. It's not hard coded as to a length of 12 or 15 or whatever. It's, it takes whatever the length of my list is and it, it uses it. Printing arrays, so same same four loops here, right? So once you write one, you copy and paste it and, and keep on keep on uh, going. So you could print list, looping through the array, looping through the array with the I. So my list, I inside the bracket. And it goes to zero, one, two, three, four, up to up to the length. So you'll be writing this all the time. Summing elements, same kind of thing. You'll be doing this in in one of our labs. You've done it in one of our exercises. You'll be doing it you know, this all over the place. Probably in the final. Hint, hint. Okay, finding the largest element. So if you want to find the largest element between the, um, inside the array. You can do that too. You shuffle the array randomly, pick some places within the array, and just swap. Swap them, um, so that's kind of an interesting way to 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 uh, shuffle the the array. 
You could shift elements. You want to shift them all one direction to the left or to the right. You could do that also. That's e easily done. Um, there's also a thing called the enhanced for loop. And th th this was, was uh, created, I think, in other languages in Java, you know, uh, created from some, all, all languages tend to converge upon the same functionality. If one language has a great, great function, then other languages are going to steal it. They're going to use the same kind of thing. They're going to do, hey, that, that, that looks really cool. Let's do that in our language too. So languages tend to converge upon one another. Okay, so in this case, we have four double value my list. So my list is the name of the array, and we have a double value, and, and that's just going to loop through the, uh, uh, the array, um, my list, and again, it's going to print each, each element of the array itself. So anyway, so this is a, a shortcut. The thing to remember about enhanced for loop in Java is that you can't update the array as you go through in this case. So you wouldn't use an enhanced for loop to initialize the array. You use it for printing, you use it for processing and doing some other stuff that's not going to change the array. You're going to list through maybe a, a, a list of employees perhaps. You're going to go do something, update their salary or something, but, but, you're, but you're not going to update the list that you're going through. So that's an important thing to remember. If you're going to, if you need to update it, use a for loop, a regular for loop. Uh, so inside inside this chapter is a really interesting uh, way to do deca card. So read this in detail about how how to uh, do this. And basically, how do you have just an array with values and represent deca cards? Because you, rec you have to rec recognize what's you know the different suits, you know, spades, hearts, diamonds, clubs, and also the nu the numbers. So basically, this is the way it works here, and use modulus, use some division. Understand this re really well, because if you write, want to write uh, a card game, this might be a way that, that you do it um, very, very easily. Um, so yeah, so card number divided by 13 tells you if the, what, the, if, what the remainder is. If it's zero, it's spades. If the remainder is one, it's a heart. If it's two, it's diamond. If it's a three, it's a club. If you have card number modulus 13, that tells you what the number of the card is. So between those two, you know if it's a two of, of hearts. Of course, you put these into functions, so you just call it and, and brings back what, what you need. Okay, so this is in our textbook. Read through it. It's very interesting. Copying arrays. You've got to be careful about copying arrays. Um, you, if you do list, here's an example, list two equals list one, you, you think, maybe, well, list one just gets thrown into list two. That's not really what happens. What happens instead is you still have, you basically... Before the assignment, you have down here on the left-hand side, list one, list two, contents of list one, contents of list two. After the assignment, list two is now gone. List two now just points to the contents of list one. So now you have one array with two different variables pointing to it. So if I change list one, it changes the contents. If I change list two, it also changes the contents. So I've got two different things. So you have to be careful of this because it, it may not be doing what you want it to do. If you want to really copy an array, you could copy it you know, with a for loop and move it back and forth, or you could use, um, like here's a for loop here. So you could, you could do, do it that way, from a source array to a tar target array. You copy element by element, and that, that would work. Um, you, there's also a thing called uh, the co array copy utility that you could do also. So you copy the, so it's a library function, basically. Um, so you're going to copy from one array to, to the, uh, the other. Um, passing arrays to, to methods. To pass it, let's see, here we have here on the, uh, down here, print array list. So the list is the name of the array, and you just pass the name of the list. That passes all the elements of the array into the, the, the into this print array here. Now in here, you have to say it's an int, and it's a array, single dimensional array, and here's the name of the array. Because in the parameters, it doesn't know it, you have to tell it what it is. Down here, you don't have to say, you just say the list. Just like, just like you're passing an integer, something, something like that. Okay, there's something called anonymous arrays that you don't name. So if I want to print array new int, and just it just it'll print those numbers. Yeah, it's not even named, but it's just part of an array there. Um, so remember passing by value when you when you execute a method when you call a method, it's going to pass the pass the integers and and boolean values, all those things by value. It doesn't pass the reference to it. it doesn't pass the the address and memory. It just pass, it makes a copy of the value and passes it down. In, but with arrays, it's completely different. It passes the reference. So when you pass an array down, 
it actually when you and you update it down below down below it actually updates the original thing so it almost makes it almost global it shares it between the calling calling statements scope and the and the called scope so it's passing arrays by value you update the array down below it updates it up above so you you'll do that a lot um, so here's the return. when you want to return something Here's the, uh, the, the the function name. You're, you're passing in a list, and you return an integer of one in one dimensional array int. And so you return the result. Returning the result is the name of the array here, right? Here it is there. So make sure you go through this. Make sure you understand exactly what's happening here. So when you pass the an array down someplace to another function, or you're passing it back again, you're just passing the whole name. You're passing all the elements. So you're passing the name. When you're dealing with individual elements, you have to use the Subscript. So that's how you have to deal with, with that. Uh, searching arrays. So a lot of times you want to search an array. You, know, you, have, you have a big array of names. Is this name in the array? Is this number in the array? You know, whatever it happens to be. So you use a for loop. You loop through it and you go to if statement and it, you put it inside its own little function here. And if it finds it, return returns it or maybe returns true. Maybe returns false if it doesn't find it. You know, there's different way, ways to do it. But basically it's just a loops, loop um, using a for loop to Try to find that element. It's going to loop through every single element of the array. So that's called a linear search or a sequential search, and th th that's not very efficient. But for what we use in class, that's no big deal. You know, ten items, no big deal. If you, you have a thousand items, it's not a big deal. If you have a million items, now it becomes a big deal because if you want to find the last item there, it's going to loop, read through all the items, a million items, to find the last one, and that that's inefficient. Um, if it happens to be the first item, then great. If it's the last item, then it, it's it, it's not not efficient at all, not effective. So linear search here, your example, we're looking for three. It starts just looping through the different subscripts, so it finds three, da da, and then it returns three. So it just return just goes through one at a time, zero, one, two, three, four, etc. Okay, so nothing more of that. Uh, there's also called a binary search. This is this is more effective. You have a million items. You want to use maybe a binary search. Now it has to be sorted if it's going to be a, be a, a binary search. Um, so what a binary search does is it looks at the looks at the middle element and says what I'm looking for is a higher or lower than that. So it eliminates half the items right right immediately. So let's let's take a look at an example here. So we're looking for eight, and we look at uh, here's the whole thing. We look at the middle is four. Is eight greater than four or not? It is. Okay. Now, now we look between six and nine. Is it eight greater than seven? Yes, it is. Is it greater than eight? Yep, yeah, it equals eight. Great, we found it. So if we, this was a sequential search, we would have had to do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different searches to find it. In this case, it only took three. So that, that, that that's that's better. Now imagine this was a million, and it it it, it definitely uh, uh, makes it easier to find find what you need faster. And here's another example. You could go through this. Make sure, make sure you understand this because this is really really important to understand. Um, Okay, binary search. Um, there's also library functions that do things. Um, in your homework, you know, you're supposed, if we say write a sort or a search, we want you to actually write the sort of the search. We don't want you to use library functions because you're, you're, you're still students. You're learning how to do it. You need the practice. It's like doing the scales for a musician. You, we need to be, need to write a lot of code and do a lot of use a library. Don't use library functions. Do it yourself until you know how to do it. Then you start using the, the library functions. Okay, sorting arrays. Um, there's lots of different ways to sort. Not, basically, it's just swapping, looking at things, and swapping things. You can go through this in detail. You guys should go, definitely go through this. I've given you some loop, some uh, this guy here. You can click on, on, on this, and you can go to, um, not in the video, but in the PowerPoint that I gave you and on, on D2L. And you can actually see how things are sorted. There's some nice animations through there. And I'm not going to go over all that. I'm not going to go over this here. Um, so put things in methods. Make things you know small. Each method should do one thing and do it well, one thing only. You want to make it as small as possible. If you have a method that's a thousand lines long, it's probably too much in a method. You need to break it up into multiple methods, maybe ten different methods. So here's an arrays dot sort. Again, don't use this unless I tell you to. Unless um, after this 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 class you can. After the, this chapter even. But right now for this chapter, I want you to sort yourself. Write the sort yourself. Uh, main. Main is just a regular method itself. So here we got main on, see on the right hand side. 
Remember main string args? So you can actually call main. On the left-hand side here, we have a program. We're calling B, program B, main, and we're passing in a string of, of, of uh, city names here. So you could call other programs their main, and you could pass them parameters in. So it comes in handy. And we'll do that some in our, our, our class this semester. You also do it from, from a command line. So you do Java, you execute the Java um, JRE, and do test main and pass some arguments in. Then they will, these arguments will pass into main into, as strings. Okay, that. okay, so that's it for this chapter, and I'll see you next time.